You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannock here with longtime panelist Christopher Zender. Today we discuss Catholicism and politics. In doing so, we'll also explore the the current debate between integralism and post-liberalism. It's a tall order, but we have a welcome and returning guest, Thomas Stork, to help us. He's the author of several books, including a new edition of his Foundations of a Catholic Political Order. In addition, he recently translated and wrote a new foreword for Louis Cardinal Below's Liberalism, a Critique of Its Basic Principles in Various Forms. Stork is a prolific writer and reviewer, and to top it off, he's an authority on distributism, as befits a member of the American Solidarity Party. Let's begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Tom, we better get started with some working definitions and keep our fingers crossed that they work. So could you tell us uh, just what liberalism is And if you get that done, uh, can you tell us about post-liberalism and integralism? Well, let me quote from what I wrote uh, a long time ago uh, about liberalism, if I may. I wrote, this was back in 2000, liberalism is that general movement in Western civilization which has sought freedom from the restraints imposed by Christian teaching and therefore has attacked Catholic culture, first on the level of Christian economic morality, secondly, on the level of the political rights of God, and lastly, on the level of the human person itself. And I would add that uh, in there comes an attack on the family as well, which uh, would become somewhere between the uh, political and the personal. So in other words, liberalism is simply a feeling. It's not really an ideology that you can say liberalism holds this because the liberals of 1810 say and the liberals of 1910 would not have agreed on many many things let alone the liberals of 2010 but in each case there was a feeling that we had to throw off restraints the restraints differed depending on a lot of factors and uh, for example in 1810 the liberals wanted to throw off economic restraints the, they, they felt they were in favor of the free market and so on. So some people like Adam Smith, David Ricardo were uh, definitely in the forefront of liberalism at the time. A hundred years later, and uh, liberals have changed and they no longer favor the free market. And uh, 
supposedly now they don't either, although it's, they don't really care about that one way or the other. Um, so, but liberalism is simply a desire to get rid of restraints, any restraints that don't uh, flow from the human the individual person are seen as an oppression. Let me <clears throat> just uh, insert something here and then uh, Christopher can take us forward. You've defined uh, liberalism in opposition to Christianity. Could there be within a Buddhist society something that commentators would quite naturally refer to as a, a, a liberal uh, reform movement? Or, or could there be such a thing, say, within Islam or, say, in classical Greek? Could we have a post uh, draconian <laughs> uh, turn towards a more liberal society? Well, I think that depends. In, in the case of of the pre-Christian Mediterranean civilization, many of the many of the restraints that in the Middle Ages, for example, were placed on economic activity, had their analogs in, in Greek and Roman society, uh, where they saw economic activity, for example, as uh, something that had to be related to the common good, not just. Of, uh, of means of personal enrichment. As far as non-Western civilizations like Buddhism or Islam, well, Islam is a kind of a, a, a borderline case, but uh, Buddhism, say, I think a lot of it depends on semantics. I mean, uh, strictly speaking, if you want to, uh, I, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't want to impose categories where they don't really belong either. So I have to say in regard to say, Asia, you know, East Asian civilizations, I have to say, is it really legitimate to use that word liberal? I don't know. In regard to Islam, probably so, since Islam shares many characteristics with Christian civilization being kind of an offspring of it. All right. That helps clarify matters. Uh, Christopher, uh, um, Tom wants us a couple more definitions. You want to push him on them? You know, in terms of your, your definition on liberalism, first of all, what is what do you think the connection is between liberalism and individualism? Because it seems to me that one of the one of the demands of liberalism, at least in the nineteenth century, was the was the liberation of the state from the church. Right. So that seems like a, a corporate um, liberation. But much of liberalism has to do with the individual, the individual businessman. The, um, the individual, the, the man or the woman who wants to have sexual freedom, those sorts of things. So where do you think th that falls? And maybe tie into that, maybe this would be a question addressing the idea of post-liberalism. Um, nowadays, we have a, a, what we consider basically a liberal society, but yet we're, we're getting, we're, there are increasing demands for restrictions of freedom of expression on a number of people, such as, you know, people who might speak out against same-sex marriage or, um, you, know, homo, you know, transgenderism, that type of thing. Where do you think, uh, the second, I guess, the second part of the question is, where do you think post-liberalism fits into, or are we post-liberal, and how is, what our, our current condition fit with what went before? Well, the, the terminology that we use, or that you say in general, general journalistic discourse or even academic discourse. And what I would see is the underlying reality don't necessarily align completely. So for example, people would talk about, oh yeah, we live in a liberal society and by which they mean democracy, uh, capitalism of some form or another, uh, individual rights of free speech and so on. I think that they're taking elements of liberalism and they're um, absolutizing them. Whereas I think that what we that what a lot of people would call post-liberal, well, one form of post-liberalism would say wokeism and that kind of thing, is really just liberalism on, on steroids, if I may use that hackneyed uh, phrase, uh, because they're in every case they're trying to get rid of restraints. And the fact that, as I said before, liberal is a liberal of 1910, liberal of 1810, wouldn't have agreed on, on many, many points. So the fact that we say oh, we live in a liberal society and these people who are 
trying to repress free speech. They're not, they're anti-liberal. Well, yes, in one sense, you could call them that. But, but I would say, no, fundamentally, they're just a new form of liberals. That's why, for example, in the United States, the, what we call the conservatives, who are essentially just kind of 19th century liberal in their, uh, in their economic, championing of economic freedom, uh, are just as much liberal as, say, a 1940s New Dealer who uh, wanted to restrain economic freedom for the common good. So, so it seems you're, you're defining liberalism in, in, as something essentially negative, re removal of restraints. Is there, what is the good liberals are, are looking for? What are, what are they seeking? Well, the, the, there, it was very true that in the, the ancient regime, uh, by and large, there were injustices, there were uh, in, inequalities, there were um, instances where the nobility, for example, had had rights that uh, were totally um, ridiculous and uh, allowed them to run roughshod, run roughshod over the um, over the uh, peasantry. Say at times, uh, despite despite uh, safeguards put in place to prevent that. So there was a kind of a resentment of certain things that were unreasonable. But instead of trying to correct those unreasonable restraints or unreasonable inequalities within the context, within the framework, I should say, within the framework of the Christian society that was left over from the Middle Ages, instead of trying to, to use that framework, they jettisoned it altogether and made, made freedom of, from restraint the principle that they worked from. So how does, it's interesting, because um, so it almost seems like they don't really have any particular good they're striving for. When you talk about integralism, I'm sure you'll talk about the common good. Uh, but it, sound, it seems like the, at best, the individual good is the good which they're striving for. But since individual goods can often contradict one another, there's really no clearly defined good to which liberalism strives. Right. Liberalism is, is, is not, it's, it's very uh, amorphous. And, um, and, and as I said, it's, it's, it is negative. Yes, I would agree. What you said was just a negative um, em impetus. Okay. So you would think that po what we call post-liberalism, despite the fact, for instance, it, it, many post-liberals seem to be uh, uh, hold to the, the, the old papal doctrine that truth has no rights. I mean, error has no rights. Um, it's still essentially liberalism. Okay. Yeah, well, post-liberalism can mean a lot of different things. But if we're talking about the kind of post-liberalism that, that we might call wokeism, uh, yeah, I think it's a form of liberalism, definitely. Uh, and, and just as, just as the 1910s liberal would have said, well, no, um, laissez-faire economics, we have to put restraints on the, uh, on the freedom of conduct of, uh, industrialists and, and so on. Whereas an 1810 liberal would have said, oh, that's horrendous. How can you, how can you restrain these people from their freedom? So nowadays, the, uh, the wokest liberals, if I may use that term, would say, yeah, we have to restrain these people. And even though a 1950 liberal might have said, oh, we can't, we have to defend to the death the right to say anything. Um, nonetheless, they're both more of liberals, mm -hmm. as I see it. And, and what, what about now our third definition we need is integralism. What is that? Well, it's a, strictly speaking, it simply means, it's simply what every Catholic should be, namely, that we accept all the teachings of the church, as Vatican I said, whether, whether taught through the extraordinary or ordinary magisterium. The thing that makes integralism specific is that integralists are particularly interested in the Catholic teaching on the social order. And most particularly, as these were restated and, and um, kind of uh, codified, if you will, uh, or summarized is a better word, I guess, by Pope Leo XIII in a series of encyclicals in the late 19th century, where he went over the relationship between the church and the social order and the church and the political order uh, in considerable detail. And integralists look back on this as a, really, I think I would say it's a remarkable, remarkable uh, moment intellectually in the history of the church uh, that we had somebody at the, um, well, I wouldn't say the beginning of modernity, but as modernity was getting going, 
um, uh, who, who restated things so clearly. So integralism simply is, uh, I suppose you'd say a Catholic integralist is somebody who's a Catholic who's Orthodox, but who particularly is focused on the, on the Catholic teaching concerning the social, economic, and political order. Now, uh, would you say that uh, Leo XIII, as an integralist, was a right-wing thinker? I think those categories, right-wing and left-wing, need to be jettisoned as quickly as possible. Perhaps we can do it today. <laughs> uh, I can start a movement. Now, that, as, as you know, as both of you know, those terms come from the accidental seating in the French National Assembly after the French Revolution. And they, aside from the, from the total um, contingency of the, the way the seating was in the assembly, obviously, it, it, it presupposes that something as complicated as political philosophies can be put on a line so that you could uh, simply say, oh yeah, he's more right than he, and he's more left than, than he is, and so on. Whereas the, the thickness, if you will, the comp complexity of, of any, of most political positions uh, really makes that impossible. So one of the things that frustrates me so much in our discourse is that we continue to use these right, left, um, conservative, liberal uh, terms. I think they have no meaning. I think they, they aren't even, they're not even shorthand. They're not even useful. They obscure thinking and make it more difficult. I agree. <laughs> now, what you've got there, we see it on the screen as a, a file cabinet and then another file cabinet. And we could have those uh, take the place of the dustbin of history. And you could file in there terms like liberal and conservative, left and right. Uh, uh, that, that would be a place to store them. But, but then you'd have to get some more files pretty quickly. Well, we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about freedom, chiefly in terms of negative freedom. But let's let's talk about government and the good. Does government, rightly understood, uh, have a a duty to uh, bring it about that? Citizens are good citizens. Does it have a duty to promote the good? And if it does, if it does, what's the good? <laughs> well, yes, it, it does. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, was very clear about this, uh, that the government has a duty to promote virtue. But as you said, uh, in a, in a uh, gradual manner and taking account of the state of the people. So, for example, if you were a barbarian king in the year 600, you wouldn't suddenly um, uh, propose the kind of social, kind of criminal code that you might have that might have worked very well in, say, Ireland in 1930, uh, when, where you had a virtuous people who were trained in uh, centuries of Catholic morality, and, and it would have been different. So, uh, yeah, the government does have, have a duty to promote the uh, individual goodness and, and the common good, too. Individual goodness, obviously, would be uh, the moral law, uh, virtue, and then the common good would be the good for society as a whole, for, and as a result of that, for every, for every citizen, for every member of society. And it would, it would include not just, it would include institutions, which is something that I think Americans are, don't see very clearly that the institutions themselves, the laws, for example, or the organizations or the forms, the form in which we organize society, themselves have to promote the common good. It's not just a matter of saying, we need good people. No, we, yes, we do need good people, as the CNC well known, but we also need good institutions, good framework, good, good political, legal framework for them to work with them. Should you uh, push our, our guest, uh, Christopher, should you push him to tell us more about the good or do you want to push him away from that and on to something else? Uh, good grief, after all. 
Well, I, I think a lot of our listeners so, so far might still be wondering what the hell is integralism. I mean, we've he's given a basic definition. Tom, you give a basic definition. Uh, but the details are a little murky right now. And our next question, actually, not only that, the past question we asked, does government, do government leaders have a duty to make a people, make us better people? Um, but the next question probably hits it right, right in the, um, right on the mark. Do they have, do governments have a duty to put society under the reign of Jesus Christ? I think that, that indicate, that will show us where the integralists stand. Yeah. Pope Leo was very, very, very clear about this, that just as an individual is under the, um, under obligations to God. So is, so when he joins with other individuals, no matter what kind of a society that might be, he's equally under obligations to God. Now, if you have a, a, an organization with a very limited aim, like say a sports club, well, they don't have to um, have prayer meetings or sponsor processions or anything like that, uh, as long as they don't do anything against the law of God. But when you have an, indiv- when you have an organization like the state, like civil society, that uh, is uh, basically take, is oriented toward the good of man at every level, then that organization has to acknowledge God uh, explicitly. Now, you, uh, does this does this hold for, uh, say, the U.S. government nowadays or any other secular government? Well, not really, in the sense that it's an impossibility, uh, and, and the the duties of a, of a a liberal government to to uh, the common good are different from the duties of a Catholic government. But if you had a Catholic, if you had a Catholic uh, culture, and the people were virtuous enough that they saw this, then yes, the state they would have a duty to put in the Catholic government that would explicitly uh, honor Christ the King and order the society toward that, uh, toward. Uh, acceptance of God and his obligations toward God. But that doesn't really hold in any practical way, certainly for our society. Do you think there's something, Pope Benedict XVI uses this term, um, healthy secularism. Do you think there's something that could be called healthy secularism? I, I would suppose the secularism he would be referring to there would be something different from what um, Leo XIII was calling for in terms of the relationship of, of the state to the church? Well, I don't really know what he meant, but what Benedict meant by that term. So I can't really say what, whether I agree with him or not, but I, but I tend to think, I, I, w- I guess I would be suspicious to think that, no, I, I, I think he probably would differ from Leo and I wouldn't agree with him. And uh, it would, that what he was saying was kind of an innovation in uh, Catholic thinking. Uh, but unless I saw the context of his statement, of Benedict's statement, it would be hard to, to, to comment definitively on that. I know that in, for example, in that 2005 address that Benedict made to the Korea, uh, he said that there needed to be a new relationship between the church and modernity. And I have to respectfully say, I don't think, I don't think so. I think Leo the third, I mean, when, the Leonine Project, which uh, was a multifaceted project, not just on the uh, social order, but on, on philosophy and uh, theology, it brought about a, a remarkable era in, in the history of the church from, say, 1878 when he became pope until, I mean, it didn't come, come to crash into an end at any particular date, but it kind of fa- petered out during and after the council. And uh, it was a remarkable period in the history of the church. Where you had, where it seems like the church was actually um, uh, reversing modernity, the bad things about modernity. Yeah, modernity can be a lot of different things, but in the case, in the case of secularization, let's say that the church was actually seemed to be reversing that. And you know, the, the church has had more respect. Converts were coming in of high quality. Uh, people were beginning to take take the faith seriously, and that was all under this program of Leo uh, of how to face the modern world. Uh, which nowadays we would, so many people, even good Catholics would think, oh, that's, that's, that's really, uh, hopeless. We could never do anything like that. Well, Leo tried and look what it did. It did something good. You- Let me, uh, introduce a couple of test cases. 
and and I also want to say something about the the best form of government. But let me start with a test case. Uh, in the Philippines, massive inroads in a substantially Catholic culture had been made by the drug trade. And in Catholic thought, a uh, great regard is shown to right reason. And if one is a drug addict, one's no longer capable of right reason. Now, along comes an elected leader, uh, Duterte, who's known for uh, ruthlessly prosecuting drug dealers who make it impossible for people to make good choices to exercise right reason. But Duterte doesn't have the kind of support at uh, intermediate levels of government that's necessary in his view to really crack down on drug dealers. So extrajudiciously, he does that very thing. And the crackdown is such that it involves the regular paralegal execution of drug dealers. Now, he might say, this, this country of ours, which is so, so constricted by deep poverty, will never be able to make any progress unless we, at least first of all, root out the drug trade. And people call me a tyrant, but actually I'm operating to restore the conditions for a good society. What, what would we say? What would you say to somebody like Duterte who makes such an argument? Well, I would say that the devil might be in the details. Uh, the, the, the notion that uh, we can't use decisive action to promote the common good, depend, you know, so much depends on, on the material conditions of the society. And on, as I said before, about the level of virtue, the traditions, and so on. And, and the corruption, I mean, if, if, for example, the judicial system is corrupt so that a drug dealer can easily buy, his, buy an acquittal, uh, then there, there might be, it might be necessary to get around it that way. I mean, if you look back at some of the early, um, early founders of, of medieval Europe, they weren't always um, exactly respecters of democratic norms. <laughs> and I think that you know, as I said, well, the devil could be the details. I'm not, I'm not certainly not going to go on record as saying I endorse everything he's doing, Duarte is doing. Some of them I don't even know, but I'm vaguely aware of what you're saying. Um, but I, I think in, in principle, uh, yes, but it, he, he, is he going too far in many cases? I don't know. Very likely. Very likely he is. But uh, it, it's, very, it's very difficult. You have a difficult situation. And you don't, you know, justice is something that has to be preserved at all times, uh, no matter what. But justice doesn't always mean that you have to go along with what we're accustomed to think of as due process, say. Uh, not that you can execute people who are um, innocent. No, that would be a, a, a terrible thing. But do you have to, to take, well, you know, uh, 19th century notions of due process, we're violating them, oh, that's horrible. Well, maybe 19th century notions of due process assumed the kind of society in which um, uh, that wasn't necessary. That, but when you, when, you, when you have a society that's sufficiently corrupted by, say, drug, the drug traffic, then you might have to, uh, without violating genuine justice, you might have to violate some of the, of the liberal notions about the process and so on. Uh, a quick comparison 
uh, we have Obrador in uh, Mexico uh, declaring an effect and end to the war on drugs. We're not going to, he says, vigorously uh, uh, address and prosecute uh, the, the major cartel leaders. And that a postscript on this postscript, trying to do so never succeeded anyway. But what we're going to do is change the social conditions so that people won't be so prone to uh, escape uh, in terms of drugs. Now, uh, Obrador never claimed to be doing that as a Catholic, but it's a, an example of uh, how one might take a very different approach to a, a society that is really, really teetering because of uh, the drug industry. But now let me go back from Duterte and Obrador to Aquinas and the forms of government. Uh, in De Reino, which is a relatively early work of Aquinas, he says with all sorts of circumspection that perhaps the best form of government really is a monarchy, but the monarch ought to always act in consultation with people. Now, back to our situation, uh, Aquinas was largely dealing with fiefdoms, and here in the United States, we're trying to deal with 330 million people, and it's I think hard to imagine what a what a king could do uh, to to maintain contact with requisite consultors. And prudence, of course, demands counsel. But but uh, that opens the way in our context for a whole intermediate range of governments, right on down to let's say the town council that. Christopher Zender serves on. Uh, how could those folks be attuned to local goods so that their measures could be ordered to promoting the good rather than simply uh, removing restrictions? Well, first of all, before I answer that, let me just reemphasize the point you made about forms of government, Leo XIII, who's sort of my touchstone here, said more than once that the form of government doesn't matter, provided that the government is concerned with the common good. He was even more explicit than Aquinas. So I, I think the, the notion, we just need to put, put, put behind us completely that notion that, yeah, integralists are hankering for a monarch. Um, maybe some are. And maybe in some uh, ideal way, a monarchy is the best state, but it, it depends so much on historical and, and uh, societal circumstances that I think it's it's um, Charles it's, Coulomb is Charles Coulomb is phoning in. He wants to have <laughs> but we're just a, not going to admit him. We won't admit him. Sorry, Charles. Go ahead, Thomas. That's just a red herring, and we don't need to even talk about that. But as far as how to get people like Christopher to be concerned about the common good, well, I don't know. That's a tall order. Uh, no, how to, a lot of it has to do with, with, uh, I mean, so, so we're, we, obviously the human race is in a fallen state. And we have a, uh, even though our nature is still fundamentally good, it is very wounded and disordered. And so promoting individual virtue on the part of politicians is, is no doubt very difficult. And uh, just as it seems like it's hard to promote on the part of the hierarchy today, but um, nonetheless, that's that's the way to do it. I mean, it, I mean and, and or the police, for example, how do we promote uh, virtue on the part of the police? Well, there used to be uh, totalities and that kind of thing that would try to work. I don't know how effective they were or whether they even grasped the problem well, but it's a matter of, it seems to me at least, it's a matter of, of virtue, individual virtue, plus, of course, the notion that that has to be permeate our thinking is what is government for? Because if, I, I doubt that, uh, I know Christopher would be able to speak eloquently on this topic, but I doubt that your colleagues, Christopher, if you asked them what's the purpose of government, they would have a very, <laughs> a very complete answer. Uh, but, um, so, but, but, um, 
you know, the individualism that that uh, Christopher mentioned before and that permeates uh, our thinking is a real hindrance to, um, to to right thinking about government. And thinking has to come before action. I mean, if you if you want to have you want to be virtuous, the first thing to do is get your thoughts in order. Uh, uh, we don't Americans don't like to think about this. American Catholics like that, that thought and virtue are, are really in separate compartments, but they're not. Uh, our thinking has to be in order if our actions are going to be in order. And so when you have the kind of idea about government that flows all the way from, from Locke, or at least intermediately from Locke, where government is simply a, a means of preserving rights that preexisted, then it's going to be hard to, uh, to get people to think about, think in terms of the common good. All right, Christopher, your name has been taken, and I hope not in vain. But go ahead, sir. Yeah, of course, we all know the purpose of government is to assure individual property rights, right? <laughs> <laughs> nay, sir, nay, sir. <laughs> what a not be said on this show. <laughs> oh, I, I guess I'm, I'm confused then. Oh, about the role of religion. Uh when you serve in an office like I do, you really, even in rural Ohio, you don't bring up religion because there's, we don't all share the same religion and that's supposed to be a private thing. But, you know, I mean, it, there's seem, religion seems to be getting a bad rap in the United States lately. But isn't it the case, Tom, you tell me this, isn't it the case in the early, our early republic that religion was held in the highest regard? That George Washington himself said that religion is necessary for a state because it makes for good citizens. Can we say, isn't that, isn't that what, isn't that what Leo the 13th said? Himself? And, and let me just quickly say that my mother again and again said, why there's no religion that teaches you to be bad. <laughs> yeah. That, that quotation from Washington's farewell address. I, I'm always astounded when Christians, either Catholics or Protestants, Quote that approvingly, because obviously, uh, may, may I may I read may I read it, Jim? May I read it? Well, it's not very long. I have it here. It says, um, "Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who would labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness." Um, let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life? It's a sense of religious obligation to desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Well, so obviously, so obviously for him, religion, and it didn't really matter what one, was simply a prop to political prosperity and to the protection of property and other good things that uh, he liked. So it, 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 he's obviously utterly uninterested in whether religion is true. It reminds me of, of the noble lie in Plato's Republic, uh, where you're going to tell a lie to the citizens in order to make them more devoted to the state. So we don't care whether the religion is true. We don't even care what religion it is. Uh, let's just promote religion. No doubt, no doubt Washington was thinking in terms of some kind of Christ Christianity, but still he, he wasn't interested in whether it was true or not. And Leo, for Leo the 13th, it was the exact opposite. The state had duties toward God. Uh, not uh, sure, this would this would work for the good of the state, but it was primarily because God was the author of the state. God was the author of society. God was the author of human nature, which uh, required the state. So they're really completely different. And and Washington, as I said, I'm just astounded when people quote Washington uh, in a in a favorable way when Christians do. It's just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. So we could say he was first in war, first in peace an off-the-wall in political theology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was, and the fact that, the fact that, um, I mean, you can say, okay, Washington was just a, 
the deistic politician of the of the late 18th centuries so and what do you expect but the fact that his his statement is quoted over and over and over again uh, still shows that we haven't really escaped from that uh, will herberg in that book uh, catholic protestant and jew quotes president eisenhower as saying and I, i'm i'm paraphrasing here but something like our religion our, our government requires a religion and i don't care which one it is <laughs> so that's um, really just Eisenhower uh, right, right of Vivus. I mean, Washington. He, right of he wasn't familiar with Los Testigos de Jehová. Uh, he would not have embraced the Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, um, well, I don't know. He might have, if, they, if, they, if they were got numerous enough, and, and of course they reject the state, don't they? <laughs> It seems that uh, rare is the government that will embrace them because they challenge governments as such. However, I want to move from what still is a, a, a dissenting body to a body that shapes the culture and never, never more so than since Roe versus Wade was uh, upended. Praise the Lord. I want to cite something from the Los Angeles Times editorial board. <clears throat> and unlike the New York Times that prints all the news that's fit to be print, so they say, uh, the LA Times prints only the news that it sees fit to print. <laughs> However, this is verbatim from the Statement of the editorial board, verbatim. Freedom is our core value. And it goes on to say, quote, we reject overreaching moves by public authorities to control the culture or private mores. Citizens' right to privacy to decide uh, for themselves how best to lead their lives. It's fundamental. It is in keeping with our Western roots to champion individual autonomy and the freedom of conscience. So uh, they're claiming the, uh, the high road, the high road. They're the ones that are interested in conscience, as is the whole heritage of the West. And that means that privacy and uh, autonomy are kings and queens, respectively. Well, what should we say about that? Well, in the first place, what the, what they mean by freedom is a kind of a is well, it's basically the the freedom as conceived by liberalism, the freedom to do to do what you want to, to restrain to throw off restraints that are imposed from the outside. Uh, there's there are other ways of talking about freedom. But well, before I touch on that, let me just talk more about this disordered notion of freedom. It's it, the the philosophy. The starting with at least Thomas Hobbes in the uh, around 1600, uh, you had the notion that the original state of mankind was apolitical, the so-called state of nature, and. Uh, there were differences between Hobbes' understanding of that and Locke's, John Locke's understanding of that and Rousseau's understanding of that. But nonetheless, in, in all cases of those and other, other right, political writers at the time, the idea of mankind is essentially free, free to do whatever he wants by nature. Society is a restriction on one's freedom, and we ought to keep those restrictions to the minimum. Now, in the United States, Locke's version of the social contract theory is practically gospel. It's, it's astounding um, how, how Lockean thought has so shaped uh, American political thinking. And this is not just not just what we would call liberals in the United States, but what we would call conservatives. They both have, for them, uh, they both have freedom in, the dis, in this disordered sense of the word as the highest good. And I think it was Frank Meyer, one of the architects of the... Um, conservative fusionist movement in the 1950s who said, what's well, conservatism trying to conserve freedom? And 
So the, the, the Los Angeles Times is trying to conserve freedom too. Now, the fact that they differ about the focus of that freedom is neither here nor there, because as I said, liberals uh, can change their mind about what they want to rest- free themselves from, and they they involve themselves in contradictions here. But that's that's they don't care too much about that. They just go on their merry way. Now, freedom can also be understood in a sense of a freedom to do what's good, the freedom to do what's right. And John Paul II talked about this in a number of places. Uh, and this is a more ordered view of freedom. Well, I shouldn't say more ordered view of freedom. It's an ordered view of freedom. I think sometimes Americans, when they read John Paul, and he says something about freedom, they read into that our Lockean notion of freedom instead of realizing, hmm, he's using the same word, but he means something different uh, from what we ordinarily think of it in the United States. Uh, and as far as I want to say, if I may, something more about you talked about, the, they talk about the right to privacy and so on. There is a sense, well, St. Thomas, for example, asked the question, should the government, should the state repress all evils? And he says, no. Now, I think in a sense, you can, you can taking that answer of Aquinas, you can begin to construct a Catholic approach to for what, for want of a better term, we'll call it a right to privacy. That's not really a very good term. But there is a, there is a, if the state, for example, started to say, uh, anyone who tells a lie will be hauled to prison immediately. Well, that would be stupid. That would be ridiculous. Not just because it would be impossible, not just because it would be a tyranny, but because it would, it would really, the state has no business doing that. So there is a certain private sphere, if you will, although I'm not totally comfortable with that term private spirit, but there's a kind of a spirit here of the individual where the state really should uh, have hands off and say, okay, they can sit in there. We're not going to worry about it too much, uh, at least now. But um, it, that's, um, that's different from the kind of locking and notion of um, privacy or freedom. But I, I haven't worked this out very well, but I'm sort of thinking about, I've been thinking lately about how to construct a Catholic approach, uh, an Aristotelian Thomistic Catholic approach to this notion of, of a private sphere, which has a different starting point from the uh, one in American jurisprudence. You mentioned lying. A recent study shows that 93.8% of verbally active Catholics tell lies. That's shocking. <laughs> Just shocking. <laughs> well, we go forth. We go forth. Christopher, your thoughts. I, I would think that, isn't it right, uh, the government's limitations are, are going to be, I mean, what... What the government does has to be to realize the common good. And when the government limits itself, it does so for the common good. So, I mean, like the case of lying, there are certain sins, certain unjust acts, which you don't restrict simply because to do so would hinder people from actually uh, hinder, hinder um, subsidiary groups like the family from, um, from their competence in actually uh, directing those sorts of activities. It would also put too many, it, it wouldn't allow enough, shall we say, freedom for individuals to actually um, exercise virtue. So, I mean, in that sense, the negative freedom is important because it does give us the ability to actually exercise the freedoms we ought to exercise and to learn virtue in that way. Um, would you say, um, I, I'm trying to think of uh, a, s- a sense how people understand negative and positive freedom. And could we understand negative freedom in this way? Negative freedom is sort of like being tied to a chair and being forbidden to walk. I mean, not, not being tied to a chair, being free, uh, allowed to walk. Positive freedom is the actual ability to walk. So uh, someone who is crippled, for instance, does not have the freedom to walk, even though he might have the freedom to walk in the sense he Nobody's hindering him from walking, but yet he's actually, but he doesn't have the ability. And this goes the same thing with virtue. Um, 
true virtue is true uh, true freedom is virtue because we have the ability to do as we ought to do um, we have the ability to do what we need to do in order to attain you know union with god do you think that is a it's a way of understanding yeah that's certainly i mean as i said i'm not this is this question of how to construct a catholic theory of of what you call uh negative freedom is something i've, I've just started thinking about so I, i'm not prepared to pronounce anything with finality on it but yeah those those what you said is helpful would be helpful in, in thinking about this uh, Leo the Thirteenth devoted an entire encyclical to freedom, libertas, mm -hmm. and he started out with uh, freedom of choice that we have, or what we usually call free will, um, and and pointed out that that's the foundation of any kind of freedom. And it's funny because if you if someone chained in a prison, say in a dungeon ten miles underground, is free in that sense, just as much as somebody who's uh, Walking around the city, you, you, nobody can nobody can force you to do anything. Can force you to think anything, even though they can uh, carry you around and chain you up. So that fundamental uh, fundamental notion of freedom, or, or not a fundamental fact of freedom, I should say, uh, is always operative unless somebody has drugged you or something like that, or brainwashed you, or something like that. Uh, but how that works out in the political sphere is something very very different, and. The Lockean political tradition has never thought about it very deeply or uh, very soundly. Which is not surprising because I, I think the Lockean political tradition was all about uh, a certain freedom for a certain class, right? Ultimately. Ultimately, yeah, it's about, yeah. about the property class to, uh, right. to keep control of their property. And it, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you're willing to. The law says if a heathen doubt of both testaments and he's willing to not bother my property, why should I care? So uh, the, uh, the the sense that there's any kind of good in the in society from holding to the true religion um, is just absent in the law completely. As long as as long as this heathen is <laughs> willing to uh, obey the law and not bother Locke's property. Here, here's a question. I think this is the question some people listening to this podcast might ask. What you say about the role of religion and the role of the state, relation of state to religion, in this case, when, Saint, when Leo XIII is talking about religion, right, he's talking about the true church of Christ. He's not talking about any other, right, not, right. Not, not just God in general, um, acknowledging God, but actually acknowledging God according to as God, as God wants to be acknowledged, and that's in the Catholic Church. Aren't you kind of, um, what, what, aren't you and Leo going against the, the latest instantiation of the magisterium, namely Vatican II? I mean, hasn't Vatican II actually said that there is, um, endorsed the liberal notion of religious freedom? Well, that's certainly commonly said. Yeah. And uh, it's a big topic. Jim, you'll have to have me on again to talk about Dinitatis and Mahani for an hour because we could go on at least an hour. But, uh, Basically, let me just say no. The um, the the document of the Second Vatican Council, the of Money, the Declaration of Religious Liberty, uh, ha is uh, I would say first of all, it has to be if if the prior teaching, the teaching of Leo, and, and in fact up through Pius the Twelfth and even John the Twenty Third, if if that teaching is authoritative, even infallible by virtue of the ordinary magisterium then we can hardly uh, interpret Vatican II as being in contradiction to that teaching, unless we want to discard Vatican II, which I think is totally uh, uh, not the right way to go. So we have to figure out, can we interpret, without doing violence to the text, can we interpret Vatican II's document in, in accordance with Leo XIII and others? And I have argued more than once, yes, we can, and in a reasonable manner, uh, and this book that Jim mentioned in the beginning, my, my book, Foundations of the Catholic Political Order, in which the second edition just came out uh, from Aruka Press, uh, I have a, a detailed argument to this effect. But let me just very, very quickly summarize it. Uh, at the beginning of, of the Vatican II Declaration, it explicitly states that this document does not overturn 
previous teaching on the duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion. Uh, there you have a kind of a, of a fundamental controlling statement for the whole document. So then you look at the rest of the document and you, and can, can it, without, without, as I said, without doing violence to the text, can you interpret it according to Leo XIII? I think you can. And it's interesting too, that if you look at, and I talk about this in the book, if you look at the um, uh, new catechism, or the, what, well, not new anymore, but the, the 1990s catechism of John Paul II, uh, its statements about religious liberty are uh, more or less in line with what the interpretation I'm giving. In fact, it even, really weirdly enough, it even has a footnote in which they reference the encyclical of Pius IX, Quanta Cora. What was that encyclical? It was the encyclical that accompanied the syllabus of errors, <laughs> the covering letter for the syllabus of errors. So <laughs> it's really pretty funny when you think about that. The syllabus of errors nowadays is an embarrassment to so many people. But here we have uh, Quanta Cora being cited as an authoritative uh, reference in, in the catechism. You know, Tom, you've uh, helped us clarify a, a number of things and <clears throat> helped us begin at least to, to weave together a lot of loose threads. So we have time for one more connection, though. True or false? True or false? Pope Leo XIII gave rise to distributism? Well, I, no, he didn't give rise to it. It goes back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> uh, true or false, with a friendly amendment, Pope Leo XIII directed our attention to the ever vibrant tradition of distributism as an alternative to the hated categories of Conservative, liberal, left and right, etc. I guess I would like to endorse that. <laughs> All right. And how did he do that? How did he do that? That wasn't in some footnote, was it? No, that was well. The encyclical that everybody remembers of Leo or Rerum Novarum was about specifically about uh, what was it, the rights and duties of labor and capital. I think is the formal title, something like that. Um, and um, it. It's, it's talking about how the economic order is part of this of this uh, common good, part of this, um, if you're going to have the whole society in, with, understands the whole society with reference to God and, and, and the true church, then the economic order is a very, very important part of that. And so uh, Raymond the Barham seeks to place the economic order within that framework. And then, and then and as I said, the, the, Leo, the Leonine revival didn't end with the death of Leo. They continued and kind of petered out in the 1960s. But uh, Pius XI in the 1920s and 30s uh, was even more, and, and the purely economic questions, he was even more remarkable than Leo. He, he extended and deepened and clarified Leo's teaching in a remarkable way. I mean, most if Catholics could see what was in Leo, Pius XI, a lot of American conservative Catholics would, would blow their top. <laughs> it's uh, he's, he's so critical of the free market. He's so critical of uh, capitalists and uh, impugns their motives and, uh, and all kinds of things like that. It's wonderful stuff. Amen to that. Now, you know, and I know, and Christopher knows, that the American Solidarity Party has been called the party that reads the papal encyclicals. The party that reads the papal encyclicals. I wonder as we come to the close of the hour, Tom, if you could tell us some other good things about the American Solidarity Party. Well, it's attempting, uh, however, tentatively and imperfectly, it's attempting to bridge this, what, what it seems like Americans regard as a fact of nature, namely, that you have two blocks, and we think of them as political blocks, but in fact, they're really cultural blocks, conservatives and liberals, and, and they're, they're political cultural blocks, or cultural political blocks, better. And, and, and are you a conservative or are you a liberal? Oh, maybe you're a moderate, maybe you have some of each. Well, this is such a stupid way 
of approaching these questions. So the ASP is trying to say, wait a minute, you know, just because I'm in favor of, of protecting the environment doesn't mean that I'm in, in favor of abortion. Or just because uh, I'm against abortion doesn't mean I'm in favor of fundamentally unfettered capitalism. And that, however, met, however often we say that, it doesn't seem to make much of an impression on uh, people who uh, talk about public opinion in the United States. Journalists can't seem to get beyond that. I mean, even somebody, if I can mention him, even somebody who I think is many, many ways a thoughtful man, Rod Dreher, just does not seem to be able to get beyond that liberal conservative uh, left-right divide. It just seems to be fundamental to his thinking. Whereas if you would see how shallow that is, it would actually help him to advance what he claims, at least, are some of his ideas. Whether how serious they are, I don't, I, I don't know. He's a he's a, but I don't mean to just talk about him. But he's an example of somebody uh, who just can't get beyond that uh, ridiculous dichotomy. It's a strange world, Thomas. Uh, the candidate in Chicago, well, no, it's in Chicago, but Illinois first congressional district, the candidate backed by the American Solidarity Party, uh, Pastor Chris Butler, uh, lost, uh, did his very best, been campaigning for over a year, lost. To whom did he lose? Son of Jesse Jackson. Uh, names count, right? And who endorsed Jackson Jr., who endorsed him? Well, uh, a fellow named Bernie Sanders and another fellow uh, whose name is not a household name, but is a cryptocurrency billionaire, a cryptocurrency billionaire who pumped half a million dollars into nauseating TV ads in the last few weeks of the campaign. So as if we didn't know, the battle is an uphill battle and our opponents are on every side. <laughs> With those thoughts, however, uh, our motto remains, siempre adelante con juicio, always forward with judgment. And our judgment is is written in God's word. And so as always, we end with the gospel for the day from Matthew. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? <clears throat> they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter <clears throat> said in reply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thanks so much, Tom, for joining us. Thank and you for having me. Us this hour. And the next time we run this program, a fellow named Peter K. will be joining us. Um, Peter Kwasniewski. Yes, I knew it was that. I just wanted to see if you knew. <laughs> of course you did. And, uh, uh, well, uh, we'll just tell them going into it that temperance is one of the cardinal virtues. <laughs> look at Christopher Sanders smiling up there in the corner. <laughs> All right. Seriously, Tom, thanks so much. Well, thank, thank you. Tom. Thank you. And by, by the way, for this first time, Ohio has been in this. <laughs> It had um, the majority representation on this show. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Dangerous <laughs> precedent. <laughs> All right.
Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.